Hi, welcome to glazing. I have my six pinch forms in front of me here and pencil and paper to take notes. And my glazes are all laid out. You can see I put newspaper down on the table. I've got a container of water here with my sponge in it and I have my paint brushes that I'm gonna use. A very nicely sized makeup brush that I was lucky enough to have. A regular paintbrush from a hardware store and I was also lucky to have some other paintbrushes at home. This is what a bone dry piece looks like. It's changed color. They're a lot lighter in color. They're really chalky looking and they have this light chalky looking appearance all the way around. Here's a piece that I've only been letting set uncovered for less than 24 hours. I think you can see this lighter color that's happening around the rim. As the piece dries, that light looking appearance is gonna spread throughout the rest of it. I'll also be able to feel a difference, a difference in temperature. It's very cold right now. It kind of has this clammy feeling to it. And as the moisture dries from it, that feeling will go away. You want your pieces to be bone dry all the way around before you glaze them. Once they're bone dry, they're extremely fragile. Here's some hints about handling your pieces when they're this fragile. Only pick them up from the bottom and pick them up with two hands. Don't pick them up like this with one thumb wrapped around the rim from the top part with just one hand. Even if I just set it on the table like this and applied pressure, it could set up a crack to start to happen underneath that wouldn't open up until later through the firing process. So you wanna handle your bone dry pieces very carefully. If you do break a piece by mistake, save it especially with these first pinch forms. These pieces are really about just trying the glazes out and I'm gonna try and use my pinch forms as almost like test pieces in a very experimental way to try out all the color options that I have. So even if I do break this piece, it's still gonna work perfectly fine as a test object. And I kinda of liked on this one how the rim was undulating before. So now that it's even more uneven, I can go back with a sponge and smooth it at this point. If I notice that it's starting to become really wet and looks saturated with water, I'm gonna just stop. Wait for a few minutes, let it dry, and then I can continue on. But you certainly don't wanna pour water over your piece at this stage, or again, you don't wanna have a puddle of water on it anywhere. But I can use the sponge a little bit if I'm very careful to do some smoothing over that top broken edge. So now I'm gonna plan out what I wanna put on my pieces. I want you guys to go and look at that matrix of colored tile samples that I put in an earlier module and choose surfaces that you want to have on your pieces. I think sculptural objects like these look better when there's more than one color on them. I can play up the differences between smooth and rough. I can bring some other associations to the form. Certainly if I use blues and greens, it might make this look more like a wave of water. Or if I use browns and yellows, it'll look more like a banana. So you can bring associations to your pieces. I can also, for example, if I glaze this smooth part white, it might make it look like the inside is more expanding or opening up. On a piece like this, if I choose a very dark color for the inside, it might make it look like it's more enclosed and like this rim is cinching in more on it. On this piece, I'll probably take the inside color and bring it over the rim onto the outside as well. So I'm thinking about the surfaces that I wanna have on my pieces. And while I'm doing that, I'm gonna take notes. I'm just doing a simple outline drawing of each piece to help me remember what I put on what area of the piece. When I looked at the samples, there are certain combinations that I really like a lot. One of my favorite ones is using a glaze called Robin's Egg on top of a glaze called Turkish Amber. I think I wanna use that on the main area of it. So I'm just gonna 
draw a line from that area on my drawing and write out here on my note sheet that that area is where I'm going to use robin's egg on top of Turkish amber. And maybe on the inside of it, I want something a little darker to make the piece look more enclosed, to play up the shadows on there. Maybe on the inside, I'll use Turkish amber only. On the assignment sheet for glazing, I explain more thoroughly the difference between underglazes and glazes. The underglazes just by themselves do not get shiny. You will get this bright green color, but it'll be a dry surface. So that's a great thing to have at your disposal if you want a dry surface. For example, I might want this outside textured area to be dry out here because if it's supposed to be like part of a tree bark, tree bark in real life isn't shiny and glassy all over and it might help this piece to look more naturalistic if I leave some areas more dry. So these are a great way that you can get color and not have it be shiny. If you want underglaze areas to have a glassy surface on them, you need to put the clear glaze on top. This is the goldenrod glaze. I'm definitely gonna stir them up in case there's any settling that's happened. We're not gonna have any glaze on the bottom of our pieces. I'm moving my brush around in multiple directions and I'm trying to feather out the brush marks so that the glaze just looks continuous. That is one coat of glaze all the way around. In order to have these glazes on thick enough to have a glassy surface as intended, you're gonna to need to put on about two or three coats depending on how thick it is in the container, depending on what kind of brush you're using. This is a soft, generous brush and it's putting on a pretty thick coat. So maybe I'll only need two, but I'm gonna let this dry for another minute before I put on my second coat. I can see that it's still damp. I can see the darker areas where there's still moisture from the glaze on here, but almost right before my eyes in about a minute, this first coat is gonna be dry. You wanna wait for the coat of glaze to be dry before you put more on. Again, I don't want this piece of bone dry clay to get water saturated. If bone dry clay gets too wet at this point, it could just dissolve. So I'm gonna be patient. Maybe I'll set this one aside and work on glazing a second piece. So on this one, I have the Turkish Amber Glaze and I'm gonna brush it all on the inside. I'm spreading the glaze around, trying to even out any drips or brush marks that might be happening as I go. I've gone all the way around once already. Now I'm starting on my second time around, but again, I wanna make sure that the surface is dry before I continue. On this piece, I'm gonna try out some of the under glazes. There's a lot of different textures I used on this piece as kind of like a sampler. So I think it'll work well to try different colors on those different texture areas. Since it's kind of a soft, natural type of object, I think I can have some areas of it that will look nice if they have a drier surface, especially if the drier surface with underglaze only is on the outside and I use a really shiny, glossy glaze on the inside then I'll have both shiny and matte working together on the same piece. I'm gonna treat the surface almost like a patchwork of different possible options so that I get the most information possible back from this first round of testing. Try a lot of different things. Just take really good notes so that you know what you did and you can repeat it if you want to. You wanna use this first round of pieces as almost like experiments so that you can see a wide range of options when you go to glaze the rest of the stuff. You can also mix the underglazes together to get more a variety of colors. I'm not saying necessarily that mixing blue and yellow will make green, but it's certainly making a different shade of blue. It's kind of green. And it's a nice thing to try out. I think of using underglazes as kind of like watercolor paints where they're semi-translucent. You can kind of see through one layer of color to another layer underneath. I like to do lots of blending with them. Maybe I'll take this new green color that I made 
and work it around into the background areas. So on this piece, I have three coats of the cobalt blue glaze on the inside. The outside, I've got various different under glazes, some areas with clear on top, some areas not. And I think I've got a thick enough coat of everything that I want on here. So now, before I'm done with it, I have to check the bottom and make sure there's no glaze on the bottom. And I think that this clear glaze came onto the bottom when I was brushing it on a little too much. So I'm gonna sponge wipe it back. Not only can you not have any glaze on the actual bottom where it literally touches, but you need to clean the glaze up in the air at least a quarter of an inch from the bottom where it touches the table. One thing I like to do to help show me where that quarter inch clearance line is to take a pencil, lay it down on the table, and you'll notice the point of it is about a quarter of an inch up in the air off of the table surface. And I'm gonna bring this pencil point up to my piece and use it to draw a circle showing me what is within about a quarter of an inch from where it touches the table. So everything inside this pencil ring, I need to completely sponge the glaze off. The glaze, when it melts at peak temperature, it's gonna move a little bit. Some of the glazes move more than other glazes. It obviously depends on how thick you put it on your piece but we cannot have the glaze come all the way down to the very bottom of the piece because then it will stick to the kiln shelves for sure. On this piece, I've brushed on three coats of the peacock glaze. And sometimes, especially with a lighter colored glaze like this, it's hard to tell how thick it's actually on your piece. So there's a test you can do by scratching into the surface with a little pin, I have a safety pin here, to try and get a sense of how thick the glaze coat is. So that when I get my results back and it seems like they might be too thick or too thin or just right, that I have more of an ingrained physical, tactile, visual memory of how thickly I laid them on to get that particular surface. So on this piece, I use the incredible black glaze on the outside and on the inside, I decided to just put a coat of the white glaze. And I want the white glaze on this part to be really smooth. So I'm taking care when I do this to brush apply in multiple different directions. I don't want this glaze coat to look like it's striped or streaked by only brushing it on in this direction. So I'm forcing myself to do some sideways brushing also and to really feather out and fan out the way I apply the glaze to minimize brush strokes or streakiness. This piece has a pretty good coat of the peacock glaze over the entire thing, but I want to do something to enhance this crazy pockmark texture that I got on the outside. So I'm going to take one of my under glazes and see what it looks like on top of the peacock. Remember, you can layer glaze on top of glaze, you can layer or mix together under glazes, with the different colors. You can also layer under glaze with glaze. And you can put under glaze, like the name suggests, underneath a glaze. Or in this case, I'm gonna put some under glaze on top of a glaze. There's really no mistakes you can make at this point in layering things together, what goes on top, what goes underneath, glazes or under glazes. Just write down everything that you do so that you can use that as information for the future. It's all good information at this point. I think you guys should try as many different things as you can and try at least a little area of all the different products that you have and try them layered in combinations with each other. I'm sure that you will get some really cool results. Just keep track, write down, in a way that you'll be able to clearly understand when you get your results back, what you put on them, because you definitely will not remember otherwise. You have to 
have clear notes of what's on everything, what layers you used, of what specific products, and in what order. Probably to glaze all six of my pinch forms, I might take several hours going back over them in stages, putting on layers, letting them dry in between. During that several hours time period, I can walk away and come back, say after 20 or 30 minutes, and let what I've been doing dry so that I can go on and build up more layers or do more sponging as I need to. On this piece, it's not clear necessarily how it goes on the table. I could fire it like this, in which case I'd have to wipe the glaze off the bottom where it's touching here and here, or I could decide to fire it like this, in which case I would have to wipe clean two different spots here and here. So, you know, it's up to you to decide the correct orientation for your objects and how you intend for them to be fired. I think with this one, I'm gonna choose to fire it like this. So that means I have to wipe it clean here and here. And I'm gonna make sure that it's free of glaze in those two spots where it's touching the table, but also all the glaze is sponged off everything within a quarter of an inch around those two spots. So sometimes an easy way to check is to get down and look at, you know, put your eyes down at the level of the table and literally look at where it's touching, especially on a piece like this that's rounded all the way around. We want to be able to see a thin line of bare clay right where it touches the table. We can't have the glaze come all the way down to the very bottom. You need to sponge up in the air at least a quarter of an inch clearance. You wanna pack your pieces really carefully. So hopefully you have some good cardboard boxes and crumpled newspaper works fine. You wanna make sure when you're packing them in the box that you have plenty of material in there for cushioning. You can use crumpled newspaper, you can use old rags, or sometimes I like to use old t-shirts or old bath towels. You'll get all your packing material back when you come to pick them up. But you wanna make sure that they're packed in a way that the rims aren't gonna scrape against the sides of the box or against each other at all because the glaze can easily chip off of the rims. You need to make sure you handle them really carefully at this stage. And I would not pack more pieces on top of these. I'm just gonna pack in a single layer and I'm gonna be really careful when I'm driving in my car to drop them off at school also because sometimes just hitting a bump in the road can make them kind of bounce and can cause some damage. So just be really careful at this stage and you should be fine. I'm really excited to see how everything is gonna come out of the glaze firing and to see all of you guys post your images for everyone else to see also. Remember, you're not just gonna have your pieces back for your own individual information, but you're gonna get to see everyone else's in the entire class. So I might have six pieces with a bunch of different surfaces on them, but I'm gonna have that times 20 to see all of those surface options. And we're all gonna share what we did with each other also. So you guys are gonna get a ton of information back once you all start to post images of what they look like. On the outside of your box, label it really clearly with your name so that Ian can make sure that he gets your pieces back to you in your original packing material. So don't forget this step. And also, when you drop your work off or at any point throughout the term, if you feel like you're running low on a glaze, maybe there's a particular glaze that you wanna use a bunch of, you can get more. All you have to do is ask Ian, tell him what you want, and through that same appointment system, he will give you additional glaze or underglaze materials for the rest of the term.